Dr. Michael Bogenschutz is a research professor of psychiatry at NYU Langone Medical Center. Prior to joining the faculty of NYU in the June of 2015, he served as professor of psychiatry and psychology, vice chair and division director for addiction psychiatry, and vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Centers. For 10 years, he was principal investigator of the Southwest Node of the National Institute on Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network. He founded and was formerly director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship Program at the University of New Mexico and has extensive experience in mentoring junior investigators. Dr. Bogenschutz's research interests focus on the development of novel combinations of pharmacologic and psychosocial therapies to improve outcomes in patients with alcohol and other drug addictions, the integration of addiction treatment into medical settings, and the treatment of co-occurring psychiatric and addictive disorders. He's particularly focused on the development of psychedelic medicines for the treatment of addictions and other psychiatric and behavioral conditions. He's currently conducting a phase two randomized double-blind control trial. Um, uh, Holly is a therapist in the NYU School of Medicine psilocybin-assisted treatment of alcohol dependence and the clinical trial on the effects of psilocybin-generated mystical experiences in religious leaders. You know, I've spoken on this topic more than a few times, and what's different about this presentation is that you know, usually I'll focus on the, the clinical trial and focus on the outcomes of the trial and go through the the background, rationale, the methodology, and then whatever outcome data we have to present. And this time the focus is going to be much more on the process of, of the therapy from the perspective of the, of the individual participant. And so I'm gonna to try to really zip through all of that background stuff as quickly as I can to leave time for Holly then to present in some detail uh, the, the stories of three particular individuals that have participated in our study. Grant support, addiction, not to belabor the point, but it's extremely common problem. A major cause of disability and death and extremely economically expensive problem as well. But the real reason that uh, we need to find better treatment for addiction is the, the uh, human suffering and lost potential it's caused. And uh, here are some famous people uh, that, that you may recognize, but they're, they represent millions of millions of people whose lives have been uh, you know, ended or uh, devastated by addiction. LSD is the prototypical classic hallucinogen, similar in many ways to psilocybin that we're currently studying. And uh, it was used in the treatment of alcoholism as early as 1953 in Saskatchewan. It was actually used clinically within programs there. And the initial rationale for LSD-assisted therapy was the idea that people would have kind of horrific experience on LSD, similar to the experience of going through DTs or delirium treatments. The results of this experience would help them to kind of see the error of their ways and hit bottom and, and regroup and move forward. What they found pretty early on was that many people were not having horrific, nightmarish experiences. They were having profoundly meaningful and positively transformative experience. What evolved came to be known as the psychedelic model of treatment, which emphasize the importance of these single overwhelming but positively transformative experiences. And the goal was to produce persisting changes in personality, values, understanding of self and others, and, uh, and behavior, including drinking behavior. Uh, there was another model of treatment that uh, was not used so much in the treatment of alcoholism called the psycholytic model, which used smaller doses of psychedelics repeatedly uh, in the context of psychodynamically oriented psychotherapy. And um, so the model that we are presenting today and, and the, the way that we've been treating addiction is much more similar to the traditional psycho, psychedelic model. A lot of people don't know there was a fair amount of pretty decent research done on LSD-assisted treatment of alcoholism. And just five years ago, a meta-analysis was done by Krebs and Johansson, taking the results of the six well-controlled trials that had been conducted using LSD to treat alcoholism and looking at what the overall effect was. And uh, to many people's surprise, what they found was that um, overall, uh, across the six studies, uh, there was a very consistent 
and robust effect favoring LSD over the control treatments. And the overall odds ratio is about two, which means almost twice as likely to benefit from the treatment if they received LSD rather than the control medication. And the overall number needed to treat is about six or seven. That means for every six people who are treated, one person would benefit significantly. And that's better than any existing pharmacotherapy or medicine that we have for alcoholism currently. So that's pretty encouraging. Psilocybin hasn't been studied as much. This slide summarizes the results of the pilot study uh, we did at the University of New Mexico prior to my coming to NYU. And this was a, uh, an open label study, meaning everyone received psilocybin. And uh, there were two psilocybin sessions uh, at one month and two months into the treatment. And, uh, and then we followed their outcomes and saw what happened. Overall, if you can see, this is the time point just before they received the first psilocybin session. And this is one month after. And so the improvement was pretty dramatic and persisting out to 36 weeks, which is nine months after the beginning of their treatment. So that's pretty encouraging. Those are large decreases in drinking. And uh, in addition, there were decreases in craving, increases in self-efficacy or confidence not to drink, and uh, improved mood. And all of these improvements correlated with the intensity of the psychedelic experience. So everyone received psilocybin, but some people had a stronger, some people not so strong experience. And the stronger the experience, the more benefit people experienced. So that seemed like pretty good proof of the concept that, that something was, was happening here. So currently we're conducting a, a double blind study uh, at, at NYU. We started uh, both at NYU and uh, University of New Mexico, and, and now it's uh, ongoing at, at NYU. We're going to recruit at least 100 participants, and the objectives are to characterize the acute effects in this population a little more closely. And the main goal really is to evaluate the effect of psilocybin versus the control, which is diphenhydramine or Benadryl to see really what the added benefit of the psilocybin treatment is. And then we will also be looking at uh, how it works, what kind of experiences tend to predict positive outcome. We have an ancillary uh, neuroimaging study that's, that's uh, happening to look at uh, changes in brain functional connectivity and uh, cue responses. And then there's also a qualitative study that we'll be doing that uh, Elizabeth Nielsen is heading up, who's, who's the, the next speaker today. So far, we've recruited 43, treated 43 participants. Uh, so we have a ways to go. We're kind of right in the middle. Very briefly on the therapy model. So there are three main components. One is the alcohol-focused portion of the therapy. And uh, it's kind of a combination of two evidence-based approaches. One is motivational interviewing, and the other is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's the alcohol-focused piece. The second piece is the part that provides a container for the psychedelic experience. It's preparation, support, and integration. So this is less directive. It doesn't have to do with a behavioral change, per se, but it's uh, providing support. And then the third is the drug administration sessions themselves. The therapy is provided by a team of two co-therapists, a male and a female, and overall flow through the treatment. There are four therapy sessions that are one to two hours long. Then comes the first medication session, four weeks into it. Four more therapy sessions that are an hour or two long. Second medication session, four more sessions after that. So the whole thing takes 12 weeks. And then we continue to follow up and see how people are doing over another six month period. And then in this study, we're offering people a third open label session at, at that point. So everyone can receive active psilocybin if they've gotten to that point in the study and they want to. So that's kind of the uh, carrot at the end and we can sort of see also how if, if, uh, if that appears to, if people get better when they receive that if they didn't get psilocybin before. Here's kind of what it looks like during the session. This is a simulation obviously, but a person's lying on the, couch, listening to a program of music, wearing eye shades. If they need a little bit of support, we might come over and make physical contact or provide some reassurance. But otherwise, we encourage them to go inside, have an internal experience, and kind of be their own guide through the process. This is what we've been doing. And now I'll hand it over to Holly to talk about some of the cases. So Holly is uh, the lead PSI therapist for the for this study. And 
she's been uh, doing a lot of this work and she's made a major contribution to kind of fine tuning and refining the, the intervention and also uh, thinking about how it actually works for people. And uh, it's really been, um, you know, my pleasure to work with Holly on a number of these, uh, a fairly large number of these participants and uh, just I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to, to work with her. I've learned a lot. So let me hand it over to Holly. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be talking to you about three of the participants that have been in our double-blind randomized study. We picked these three because they do a really good job of illustrating how varied the experience can be from participant to participant, but also from session to session. It is a double-blind study. We don't know until the end of the study what people actually got in terms of medication, uh, but usually at the end of the day, we have a pretty good guess. <laughs> but not always. Um, so, uh, one other note that the names have been changed, of course, in the interest of confidentiality. The first case that I'm going to present is Mark. At the time of enrollment, he was 25 years old. He was living with his parents, working for an investment firm, and had a history of problematic drinking since he was a teenager. He was a binge drinker and told us that his drinking led to frequent blackouts and that episodes of drinking days at a time frequently resulted in him missing work. He also expressed some concerns about his health. He said that he wasn't really feeling any negative consequences in regards to health from his drinking, but recognized that while he was intoxicated, he sometimes engaged in risky behavior. So he was worried about that. He, at the time of intake, he had drunk um, six out of the 84 days with an average of 22 drinks per drinking day, which is really a lot of alcohol. Uh, he had tried unsuccessfully in the past to stop He'd been in a residential treatment, uh, outpatient therapy. He'd tried a number of medications, and he had been to a total of 200 or more AA meetings over the course of his attempting to stop his drinking, and none of these had been successful. At the end of the, his first um, meeting with us, he said, I just want to have a normal life. He, he really wanted um, help with this problem. So his first medication session was interesting. He uh, spent much of the day, as he told us the following day, wondering whether or not he'd received psilocybin. He really had a hard time describing the experience. He wasn't able to um, identify any particular narrative or sequence of events or really much of anything. And he was perplexed and... Uh, still wasn't 100% sure whether he'd gotten the psilocybin, though he tended to think he did. Um, interestingly, in the questionnaires that we give participants at the end of the medication day, it did, um, those questionnaires indicated that he'd had a moderate level of intensity of experience and that there had been moments of awe and there was alterations in his perception of his self. There had been insights and... Uh, even moments of profound peace during um, the session. At the end of the day, he told us, it was almost like finding the holy grail and the answer to all of life's questions. So in between that medication session and the following, he would come in for his sessions and report that he was completely abstinent and he was surprised and pleased at how easy it was to refrain from drinking, and also how little time he was spending thinking about alcohol. His second dose um, in the second medication session was higher based on the fact that the initial session was somewhat moderate, and he felt the medication as much stronger, and it led to significant anxiety. Uh, he was faced with all of his um, feelings about his past alcohol use, all of the guilt and the shame and uh, remorse and really had to look very um, 
intensely at what all of that had meant for him. And then he went on to say that the experience was akin to dying and being reborn. And he kind of chuckled when he said this because he said, I never really could, you know, understand what all of that was about, all that dying and being reborn and all of that. But in fact, he felt that that's what had happened and that he had been given a new slate, as he put it. And when he felt that uh, he'd been given this new chance, he said that he felt immense gratitude. And he said, at one point, I could have cried for joy. And this, too, was something that was completely new to him. He said he had heard about people shedding tears of joy, crying for joy, and that it never really resonated with him. But in the medication experience, he really felt the gratitude so profoundly that he was moved to tears. But he didn't cry because he didn't want us to see him crying. So following the second session, um, he reported every time he came to see us that he was still abstinent, that there was very little thinking or desire about alcohol or desire for alcohol. He said that uh, he was also able to kind of let go of things that in the past would have resulted in him carrying around resentment and anger. And generally experienced himself as being less judgmental and more open to understanding, more open to more understanding rather. He elected to have the third open label session and in his prep session for that, he told us that things continued to go well. Uh, this is seven months later. And he was still abstinent, still spending hardly any time thinking about alcohol, that in addition, he was reading more, that his work was going well. He had gotten a promotion at work. And generally, life was good. However, he said that the promotion at work had resulted in uh, a real increase in his stress level and the additional responsibilities that he had were um, creating a lot of anxiety and that's what he was really presenting with uh, that day and told us that that's what he hoped to get relief from when he had the medication session. So the dose that he had on that third open label session was the same as the dose of the second session. The effects were stronger and challenging and he said it was a crash course in dealing with feelings of disappointment, regret, shame, and unworthiness. He also added that there were a couple of eureka moments, and he said that the session ended with a feeling of calmness and comfort and reassurance. We have a few more sessions after that open label session, and he reported that there was indeed a huge relief from the anxiety that he'd been experiencing. And 54 weeks um, is our last meeting with the participant. At that point, and that's from 54 weeks from the first time that they come to meet with us. So he came in and told us that he was continued to be abstinent, that life was going well, and he was very, very grateful for the experience. He said that he felt that he was maturing and that maybe part of him had died when he gave up alcohol. And he said, I wouldn't be surprised if I never drank again. I got exactly what I needed from the experience. I'm gonna move right on to Steve. Steve is a, was 52 when he began our study. He, at the time of enrollment, he was, had been unemployed for a year and was living with a roommate. His alcohol use had become problematic in college when it had negatively affected both his academic and athletic performance. He had gotten an athletic scholarship, but due to his alcohol use, he didn't finish college, and he had a lot of remorse about not having lived into his full potential. At the time of our, um, enrollment, he had been drinking 83 out of the previous 84 days, and was averaging about four drinks per drinking day. He also was worried about his health. He, his father had died of alcohol-related complications, and while Steve wasn't noticing any ill effects from the alcohol on his health, 
he did worry that his luck was going to run out. And in addition to all of those concerns, he was Muslim and in his faith, alcohol was prohibited, so there was a lot of conflict for him around um, his faith and alcohol use. He had grown up Christian and converted, and he had a lot of fears about the afterlife. Uh, based on the stories from both Christianity and Islam, he was worried about what was gonna happen if he continued to live um, not according to his religious principles. So he came in for his um, first medication session. Uh, part of his intention was to connect with his deceased father. He took the medication, put on the eye shades and the headphones, lay down, and within half an hour or so, it was clear that he was experiencing some of the effects of the medicine, and shortly into it, we noticed that he was doing a lot of grimacing and holding on to his belly. And shortly after that, he sat up, took off the eye shades and the headphones, and told us that he was experiencing extreme nausea and pain. So he sat on the edge of the couch, we brought him a wastebasket, and for the next two or more hours, he sat there clutching his belly and trying to vomit and spitting repeatedly into the wastebasket and nothing that we could say or do seemed to be helpful. So we just sat with him and um, let him be in his process. So he was okay, but eventually he lay down um, again and said that it was a while before the nausea and the pain left, but eventually it did. And by the end of the day, he was fine and feeling back to himself and left. And the next day he came in for his debrief session. And this is what he told us. He said that when he first felt the medicine start coming on, he noticed the feeling of high that he, he had previously told us he didn't like what he called a drug high. He had taken mescaline on two occasions and didn't like the feeling of the drug high. And so he felt that and, but very, Soon after that, he felt that there was some kind, he felt the presence of his father, and he felt that there was some mutual forgiveness exchanged and communicated. But right on the heels of that, he recalled that in his faith, it was not allowed to try and communicate with the dead. So he moved away from that and was suddenly. Um, finding himself experiencing the nausea and the pain and you know then he sat up and went through that whole period of trying to vomit. What he told us about that that was really interesting is that at one point he's you know over there sitting on the couch doubled over looking into the wastebasket spitting and he saw his saliva as beer suds and when he saw that he decided that he was detoxing all of the negative effects of alcohol. So he intentionally spat out shame, unworthiness, anger, resentment, all of the things that were associated for him to his um, alcohol use. He said that nothing ever felt worse than those two hours, but he was pleased that he had quote unquote weathered the storm and he said that as a result of the ordeal, he was feeling less hard on himself and was experiencing less guilt. He also said that having, um, seeing that he had the strength to get through that experience, was, which was really the most challenging he'd ever had, it had given him a new, um, it had affirmed and strengthened his resolve to abide and live um, in accordance with his religious principles and to get his life back on track. So immediately following the medication session, there were a few sessions in which he said that there was kind of a heightened sense of anxiety due to seeing how much of his life had gone by without his, you know, taking, living up to his potential. But within four weeks of the medication session, he'd found himself a job and he had enrolled in school. And as he began to make these concrete changes, he 
felt more and more optimistic about his future. He elected not to have the second medication session, but he did comply with all of the uh, other therapy sessions that were outlined in the study. And at 54 weeks, when he came in for that last um, meeting with us, he reported very happily that he was um, still working, that his living situation had changed for the better, and that um, he was pursuing a degree in social work, which was just perfect for him. And he was really pleased and optimistic about his future. Next, I'm gonna to talk to you about Mercedes. Mercedes is a 52-year-old woman who came to our study with huge concerns about her drinking. Her drinking had become problematic when she was in college, and since then, it had just been a source of distress. She was concerned about the effects that it was having on her emotional and physical health, saying that it led to social isolation, that she had hangovers, and perhaps more than anything else, she was tortured by extremely self-critical thinking um, and shame and remorse. She told us that in the mornings, invariably she would wake up and the first thing that would happen was that she would hear her voice just pounding, you know, berating herself for perhaps having wine in the night before. Uh, at the time of her enrollment, she'd been drinking 67 out of 84 days with an average of three drinks per day. She had tried in 1993 to stop drinking. She'd been in a residential treatment um, program and had gone to about 29 AA meetings, but these hadn't helped her with her problem. Um, so in her first medication session, she said that it took her a while to feel the effects, but when they came on, she found herself thinking a lot about her mother. Her mother had been an extreme alcoholic who had been physically, emotionally abusive and neglectful and abandoning. So Mercedes found herself thinking a lot about that, but told us that she was surprised that there was no anger, there was no feeling of anger associated with all of that um, thinking and memory. She then went on to say that the, she, she went on to think about how negatively she viewed herself and um, got to really examine all of those negative feelings that she had. And in addition to that, she thought about her feelings of alienation from God, as she put it. Years ago, she had had an experience that had resulted in her feeling really connected to something bigger than herself, uh, to a feeling of, of oneness and a feeling of God. And that had, over the years, just kind of dissipated, and she was sad about that. So in her session, she said, why have you abandoned me? And the answer that she received was, why are you so controlling? She wanted to continue that thread, but needed to use the restroom, and on the return from the restroom, she wasn't really able to pick up there. In the sessions that followed this first medication session, she reported that there was a definite brightening of her mood, that she was thinking less about drinking, that she was drinking less, and that there was a significant decrease in the negative self-talk. So her second medication uh, session came. She also got a higher dose based on uh, the intensity of her first experience. And she said that it came on faster and stronger and that the entire experience was one of dealing with, well, not the entire, but for a lot of the experience was chaos, absolute chaos. She said that she couldn't put two thoughts together, that she, um, it was just a swirling mass of information and, and, and chaos, and that underneath all of that, she could see a deep well of sadness. Now, in our prep sessions, we encourage people and talk about the importance and value of meeting the experience, welcoming it, and going with it, rather than trying to control or resist it. But it's a lot easier said than done, and 
Mercedes found herself trying to make sense of what was going on, trying to give it some structure, until finally she got to a point of saying, I'm going crazy. And her one consolation was that she was at Bellevue already. <laughs> and she said, well, at least I'm going to be safe. But at the point that she said, OK, I'm going crazy, everything changed. And she found the experience suddenly open up into a really spacious place. Everything quieted down. And she heard a voice, which she recognized as her own voice, say to her, I'm going to tell you a secret. It's the worst kept secret in the universe, because everyone knows it but you. You are a perfect creation of the universe. And she felt that all was one, that all was love, and it was wonderful. But then she noticed that um, she began to question whether that was really true. And the voice came back and said, is this true? And what happened over the next little while was that she would raise doubts or objections or questions about whether or not this was true. She would examine those and then let them go so that eventually no more doubts were arising and she was able to spend some time just in a state of total love and self-acceptance. So following this second session, uh, she told us that uh, she had really complete relief from all the negative self-talk and that things were going well. She resumed meditating. She was socializing more. Um, alcohol, she was, she was abstinent for a month after the medication, second medication session. Eventually she um, started having an occasional glass of wine, but it no, alcohol no longer held that place in her psyche and she wasn't um, feeling it as a compulsion or, or a problem. In speaking about the spaciousness that she felt afterwards, she said, the noise can bubble up, but it doesn't overwhelm me. When these little anxieties walk into this big room, they seem so little. I feel peaceful and I feel safe. It feels good to be in my body. I found myself taking these wonderful breaths and the negative remarks don't even pop into my head. The last session she had, it was the open label session. She presented at that time with extreme anxiety that had begun with the presidential election. And <laughs> the only time that she drank in excess um, from the time of the first medication session was the night of the election. And she said, that all of the other, all of the positive effects of the medication sessions had persisted, but the anxiety was overwhelming. And that's what she hoped to get relief from. The second session was the same dose, uh, I mean, the third session was the same dose as the second. She s described the experience one of hours and hours of absolute pure anxiety. No storyline, no narrative, nothing. But the following day when she came in for the debrief, she reported that there was no more anxiety, that that had completely lifted. And at 54 weeks, she told us that all of the positive effects from the medication sessions had persisted. So that's, um, those are the three. And now Michael's gonna come back and talk to you about some of the outcomes. Yeah, well, heavy drinking days is our primary outcome. By 12 weeks, nobody of these three people was drinking heavily. One person, Mercedes, whom we just heard about, did resume drinking on about 40% of the days. This is percent drinking days, but if you look at drinks per drinking day, when she did drink, she was drinking about one drink. So this was a persisting pattern of drinking pretty regularly, but never drinking even close to heavily, which was pretty remarkable and not what we're told happens with alcoholism treatment. Craving pretty consistently went down. Self-efficacy or confidence, which I mentioned, went up. Problems were pretty much non-existent by uh, 24 weeks and, and all the way out to 54 weeks. And self-compassion, a feeling of, of self-love for Mercedes, who's the purple line there, went up pretty strikingly. For the other folks, it, it stayed about the same. And mood and anxiety went way down. And as Holly described, the mood and anxiety symptoms did kind of creep back into people's lives by the third medication session and then immediately kind of go back down. So that effect didn't seem to be quite as persistent as the effect on drinking, but still pretty persistent. 
I mean, those are our basic impressions. The experiences are quite variable. They're almost always vivid, memorable, and meaningful. They don't necessarily focus on alcohol. The benefits can be quite broad, well beyond the drinking outcomes. There's often this quality of, I, I got exactly what I needed from this session, uh, which is kind of hard to put into, hard to quantify, but it's very much part of the experience. And it supports our approach, which is really not to direct the, the experience in any particular direction, but to encourage people to have, uh, that the, they will have the experience that's, that's right for them and, and make their own meaning out of it. So, so that's, that's what we have. And thanks to our team, the NYU team, the UNM team, various other people from Hefter and the Johns Hopkins who provided some support and our generous donors. So thank you. All the older work was in LSD, so why do we go to psilocybin? Uh, LSD is, you know, probably one of the most stigmatized molecules on the planet, and uh, psilocybin much less so. The other practical advantage is that how long it lasts. The session can be accomplished. Uh, the acute effects are generally over within six hours. The whole session is eight hours. LSD can, can you know, the effects can go on 10 hours or more, which makes it really, a, a really, really long day. So we don't know that psilocybin is better or worse than LSD. Certainly the effects are are similar, but they're not identical, and it's certainly possible that one or the other is, is less or more effective. But practically, we, we went with psilocybin for those reasons. What we use is synthetic psilocybin. It's, you know, 99-something percent pure, and it, um, yeah, it, it has not, nothing to do with the, the mushroom, it's purely synthetic. So um, I'm not aware of any controlled trials with uh, using mushrooms per se, um, but, um, you know, I mean, that's another place we can't necessarily assume it's, it's going to be identical, but it's a lot easier to do trials with a pure chemical, we know exactly what we've got. It's an outpatient study, so people have to walk in the door. Can, they have to be, you know, no blood alcohol on board and to uh, get to uh, consent for the study and do the screening and so forth. And, and they need to be free of withdrawal. So uh, somebody who's drinking around the clock and really can't stop, they'd need to go have a medical detoxification. But the vast majority of, you know, at any point in time, the, the vast majority of alcoholics aren't physically dependent to that extent that they can't stop. And, and the people that, that come respond to an ad, by and large, they're people who, whose lives are not completely devastated. They have some, many of them are working, most of them have some meaningful relationships. They're just, you know, functioning way below their, their potential and really miserable and feeling trapped and out of control. But they're not the most severe end of the, of the spectrum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Bogenschutz, Holly Duane.